Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today we'll be discussing the case of a young woman who disappeared roughly one hour after last speaking with her husband over the phone. With no note left behind detailing her whereabouts and no sign of a struggle seen within the home, the woman was reported missing, and shortly thereafter found murdered in her vehicle at a nearby shopping plaza. But how and why did she end up there? Today's case is part one of the murder of Judy Brown. Judy Brown was born in Patterson, New Jersey on March 10, 1955, to parents Stanley and Marie. Her family later moved to Prospect Park, New Jersey, where Judy grew up with her two sisters, Linda and Claire. As a child, Judy attended St. Paul's Elementary School, and once she'd reached her teenage years, she attended Manchester Regional High School and graduated from there in 1973. From what I can tell, right after Judy graduated, at around 18 years old, She landed a job as a trainee at the New Jersey Bell Telephone Company and worked in their Little Falls, New Jersey location. Come 1976, when Judy was about 21 years old, she married her husband, Peter Brown, who was four years her senior. The couple were married at St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church and continued to attend services there throughout their marriage. Just a year after the couple wed in 1977, they purchased a modest raised ranch-style home located at 8 Sherbrooke Drive in Rockaway Township, New Jersey. Over the years, Judy continued to work her way up at the New Jersey Bell, and by the time 1983 rolled around, she'd been working there for almost a decade and had earned herself the title of Senior Service Analyst and was working at that time out of the company's Ledgewood, New Jersey location, which was only about a 15-minute drive from she and her husband's home in Rockaway Township. From all accounts, Judy was a hard worker and a dedicated employee. Also, at the same time, in 1983, her husband worked part-time for his own business, Criterion Electric, and he also worked full-time for a company in New York as an electronics engineer. It was also reported that he'd previously been a firefighter for the Fairlawn Fire Department, but I can't quite tell when or for how long he worked there. Now, Tuesday, January 4th, 1983, seemed like any other day, with both Judy and Peter heading to their respective employers that morning. After the long workday, around 5 p.m., Judy Brown was seen by a co-worker getting ready to leave the office and head home for the night. She was then seen by another employee of the New Jersey Bell sitting in her car, also around that same 5 p.m. time frame, waiting for her car to heat up before leaving the parking lot and starting her drive home. Due to the close proximity of her home and work locations, she likely arrived to her house no later than 5.30 p.m. that night. Then, sometime between 6 and 6.30 p.m., Peter Brown called his house to alert his wife that he was going to be a little bit late getting home that night. Judy answered the phone, the couple chatted for a few minutes, and it appeared as though everything was fine. About an hour and a half later, at approximately 7.45 p.m., Peter arrived home from work to find that his wife and her car were not there which surprised him because Judy hadn't mentioned anything about planning to leave the house when they'd spoken just a little while earlier. At first, Peter was a little taken aback by the fact that Judy wasn't home, and that was mostly because there wasn't a note left for him to alert him of where she would be. And he felt this was odd because Judy was the type of person that always left a note if she were going to be leaving or if she'd be out late or something like that. Her mother had also stated that she was a very communicative person and always wanted everyone to be in the know on what she was doing or where she was going, assumably so they didn't worry. Peter also later told the daily record of his wife, quote, Sometimes, if Judy is going to be late and visits her sister in Lyndhurst, she will tack a note on the refrigerator, end quote. Now, earlier you had mentioned that she was last seen by her co-workers in the car, in the parking lot, and warming up her vehicle. Correct. Is it inclement weather at this point? Is there snow on the ground? Do we know if it's just cold? Well, it's January 4th. (laughs) Right, so I assumed cold, obviously, but... Cold, yes. Nothing was mentioned about snow or anything? No. Okay. I was just thinking, like, would she have traveled because there was snow on the ground? Like, would Mm -hmm. she really want to go out and do anything? 
Yeah, no, it didn't seem like that at all. It seemed like normal, cold, New Jersey, early January weather. Okay, so there would be nothing outside of the temperature that would, you know, prevent her from wanting to go to do something. Correct, yeah. All right. So despite the lack of communication, Peter wasn't too troubled by his wife's absence at first, probably due to the fact that everything was in its place in their home and it didn't appear as though there was any sort of struggle, nothing was out of place, you know, it just looked totally normal. You can assume he probably figured she just ran to the store quick and she'd be walking through the door any minute. But as time went by and his wife still hadn't arrived home, he started to feel more and more panicky. So he decided to start calling around to friends and family to see if Judy was with any of them, or at the very least, to see if anybody had spoken with her. From what I've gathered, no one else had talked to Judy that night, and the last time she'd been seen was that 5 p.m. sighting at work when she was waiting for her car to heat up, and the last time anyone spoke to her was when Peter called earlier in the evening. Neighbors did also appear to have been interviewed later, and from all accounts, no one in the neighborhood saw Judy leave her house that night. But we have Judy placed at the house at roughly the latest 6.30. Correct. When she got off the phone with Peter. Mm -hmm. Now, something that stood out to me regarding how out of character this was for Judy had to do with something else that her mother had said. She'd mentioned that Judy wasn't the type to leave her home at night by herself. So her not being home, not having talked to anyone, not left a note or anything like that was definitely worrisome by this point. And it's cold winter Mm -hmm. gets dark early in January, so by 7.45 or even by 6.30 probably, it's probably getting dark. It's probably pitch black. If you think about it, we're right around this time frame right now in New England. So Mm -hmm. you're looking at probably 5 p.m. It's already dark. If she's leaving the house past 6.30, I know I don't do that by myself. (laughs) I'm like, it's too dark. I feel like I can't see when I'm driving. Exactly, yeah. And just another point to make too, and I don't know how many other people are like this, but I know I am. Personally, if I'm driving at night and I have to wear glasses, I don't like that. I would prefer to wear Mm -hmm. my contacts. But a fact about Judy is that she did wear glasses. So driving at night when it's already dark, Mm -hmm. wearing glasses. The glare from other headlights. Yeah, it just just seems like exactly. So I don't know if she was that type of person as well. Like maybe that's another reason why her mom said that, you know, like she just did not like to go out at night for A, B and C reasons, you know? Yeah. And I think like. I know you had mentioned kind of just nonchalantly, not that this is what actually happened or what Peter actually thought happened, Mm -hmm. but, you know, Peter was on his way home. Mm -hmm. So if she needed him to grab something, she just talked to him roughly a little bit more than an hour earlier than that. Exactly. So it's not like she really needed to run to the store to get something because she could have just asked him to pick it up. I would do the same thing if it were you, unless, <laughs> oh, you know, know, it's putting you out like that one time where I was like, no, I'll be a big girl. I'll go to the store yeah, even though yeah. I don't want to. But, you know, if it's like, oh, just grab milk or a loaf mm-hmm. of bread or something like that's a quick, easy stop. You could probably even stop by a convenience store on your way home to grab that. So, right. So you you would have to assume that for Judy to leave her house at this time in the cold dead of winter, you would assume based on her personality that we've learned so far that it had to have been some type of emergency. Maybe somebody was in need or Mm -hmm. somebody asked her to do it because why would she want to? Yeah, why else? You can't really, I mean, I can't really Unless she ordered a pizza and she was going to go pick up a pizza and surprise Peter with it, something like that. Yeah, maybe. That's not a bad point to bring up, but still, I don't know. Yeah, it just seems like everybody had said so far it's out of character for her. Mm -hmm. You know your husband's on his way home in a little bit. If you needed him to pick something up, just ask. Yeah. Especially because she talked to him. It's not like she tried calling his office and And didn't get him. him. Yeah, exactly. Like they were on the phone. So Mm -hmm. that's just another layer of this is weird. Yes. And the fact that she's super communicative Mm -hmm. that if she was planning to go somewhere, again, not to belabor the point, Mm -hmm. she was just on the phone with him. Yeah. She could have said, hey, I'm going to so-and-so's house. And so you don't worry. Right. This is, you know, what I'm doing. And if she's that type of person, I think about myself too. And I feel like, you know, a lot of Judy's personality like resonated with me because I know, do you remember that time that I was going to Whole Foods to pick up groceries and I had mm-hmm. changed my outfit from what I was wearing in the morning. <laughs> and you're like, and I was just like, so you know, if I go missing, I'm wearing this, this and this. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, he probably would have seen me on the camera as I left the house, but whatever, you know, right, I right. just want to be sure mm-hmm. you knew where I was going, what I was doing. Mm-hmm. No, we don't do that weird share my location thing on yeah, our right. phones, but I at least <laughs> tell you what I'm wearing, where I'm going so that you're in the know. Yeah. And you're not worried if you were to come home and like, oh my God, my wife's not home. What's going on? Right. And that's the same thing. If you were out doing something and I needed to run somewhere. 
I mean, we have the benefit of technology now mm-hmm. and cell phones and everything. So I would just shoot you a text and say, hey, I'm going here or whatever. Yeah. The note on the fridge is essentially text of, right. you know, that yeah. time. Right, right. Let's keep going. Okay. So in regards to when Judy was reported missing, there are many articles that state that Peter waited until around 8.30 a.m. the following morning, Wednesday, January 5th, to report his wife missing. I did find an article or two that stated Peter had actually called police around 11 p.m. the night of the 4th to report Judy missing. And that comment regarding this 11 p.m. call was actually made by the county prosecutor at the time, Lee Trumbull. However, I have also seen it mentioned that Peter himself said that he didn't report his wife missing that night because he wanted to make sure she wasn't just out and about with someone else or staying at a friend's house and You know, he didn't want to make this big deal out of something that might not have turned out to be anything serious. Yeah. And you could imagine how a conversation could have went when Mm -hmm. he called police. Hey, was anybody in an accident? Mm -hmm. Have you seen my wife? Has anybody called in about my wife? This is her name. This is the type of car she drives. No. Okay. I'm going to wait a little while, maybe under the instruction of police. Mm -hmm. Wait a little while. See if she comes back. Let us know. I guess it's somewhat understandable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so far, there's nothing weird about Peter, in my mind, anyway. No, me either. I mean, of course, we're like hyper vigilant with this. So we're not, when you <laughs> yeah. said to me, he waited till 8.30 a.m. to call police and notify that she was missing. I was I, like, what? But I then, saw the eyebrow raise over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wrote it on my notepad and I'm putting a star next to it and yeah. circling it. But I mean, knowing that he talked to police. Mm hmm. You can only assume what happened during that conversation. Exactly. And I was just thinking, you know, maybe it could have been that whole situation where they say like, oh, she's an adult. Mm -hmm. She can leave if she wanted to. Like, maybe just wait till the morning if she doesn't show up or something like that. I can envision that conversation being had Mm -hmm. in 1983. So, you know, I don't know if that's what happened or, you know, if the 11 p.m. call was actually ever made or if there's some sort of, you know, confusion in the reporting on it. But either way, she's reported missing. 8.30 8.30 the next day. Exactly. But when you said, oh, wait and see if she's out and about with somebody else, I was like, could infidelity be a thing? Could she have left? It doesn't seem like that's the case so, so far, far with their it relationship. Doesn't, no, but you can't rule anything out yet. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things where you need more fact mm-hmm. of the story before you can maybe contemplate or speculate on that idea. So we'll keep going and we'll see what else we learn as we keep going through the story. Sure. The only thing I want to attach to that is you have a guy that owns his own business and works as an electronic engineer, so he's probably super busy. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's coming home at almost 8 o'clock at night. He's coming home at almost 8 o'clock at night. Yep. I mean, you don't want to assume infidelity at that point because she feels like she's always left at home because he has all this work. Mm-hmm. Could it be a thing? It could be, but it just as easily could not be. So Exactly. Let's yep. get a little bit further into the story. All right, so now, as of 8.30 a.m. on the morning of January 5th, Judy Brown was reported missing, but it's a bit unclear which agency she was reported missing to. There were some little discrepancies on this fact in reporting on the case, but I'm going to assume Peter called his town police, which would have been the Rockaway Township Police Department. But regardless of who the call came into, authorities in the area were now on the lookout for 27-year-old Judy Brown, who was described as being 5 feet 4 inches tall, 160 pounds, with light brown hair, and she also wore glasses. Along with that, police were also keeping an eye out for Judy's vehicle, which was a red 1973 Ford Maverick. Now, if you want to look at what I sent you on Discord, you can see that I have sent you a picture of Judy. I sent you a picture of Judy and her husband. Damn, Judy. Nice car. Yes, and Judy's car. Exactly. So I feel like this is a common thing. Every time I'm working on a case and a car is involved, Mm -hmm. it's either a Ford or a (laughs) VW. Well, we're doing a lot of older cases, though, and like... There weren't as many car brands back then. No, of course not. But like, I don't know. I was like, everyone drives a freaking like sporty car back then. Yeah, honestly. It's very interesting. I mean, what else we had? We had a Mustang. Mm Mm-hmm. The Fox Body Mustang. That was... um, Lynn Vest and Jeremy Pickens. Yes. Then we had... um, Well, no, not that's not the one I was thinking of. Lynn Vest had the one... She had the Cobra. Yes. The other one I think you're thinking of is Sherry Magaro. Yes. Where yes. the Mustang was just on the side of the road in the snow. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Strange. A lot, of, uh, a lot of muscle cars. Makes yeah. you wonder, do you think that people are targeted for their vehicles? Well, I was wondering the same thing. I'm really glad that you brought that up because 
a lot of times on these older cases, like Lynn Vest and Jeremy Pickens was a perfect example to bring up, is they had this super nice car and robbery was potentially considered an option Mm -hmm. as the motive for their murders. So then I don't think you can discount that in a lot of these cases. If you're looking at somebody's car, I think we talk about this a lot, John, regarding your love of watches Mm -hmm. and, you know, all these YouTubers that you watch and like people who are targeted because they're wearing a Rolex and they know that that's a lot of money and, you know, they could be attacked or robbed or something like that because they have an expensive piece on them. Mm -hmm. So could it be the same thing in terms of a car? I mean, it very well could be. The only thing is it's way easier to conceal or to pawn a watch than it is a vehicle, just like in Lynn Vest and Jeremy Pickens' case. Yeah. I mean, you had multiple witnesses that saw another guy Mm -hmm. driving the vehicle. Well, I'm just thinking more along the lines of like, are they going to have a lot of cash? Do they have Mm. credit cards with high limits on them? Can I take that and go buy a bunch of stuff? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it that way, it's risky, but it could just be... Criminals are dumb. (laughs) (laughs) We know that, so... Yeah, it it (laughs) could just be a a commonality between all these cases that, you know, when we're dealing with these 70s and 80s Mm -hmm, time periods, mm -hmm. it's these nicer muscle cars and stuff. Yeah, I just feel like everyone drives a muscle car. I think it's very strange, but... Yeah, this Maverick looks nice. I know that's probably not her. That is not her Maverick, no. And disclaimer for everyone listening, (laughs) I'm going to have a photo of it on our socials and our website and all that good stuff, but this photo came from a different website. I'll have their URL listed, but... It's not hers exactly, but it was the same year, the same make, model, all mm-hmm. that good stuff. So, She looks very familiar. She's got like one of those faces. She's got a friendly face. Yeah. She really does. Big smile, mm-hmm. both in her wedding picture and what is that, like a high school picture? I don't know. I don't know. It could have been, for all you know, too, I was thinking about this, like, Back in the day when you go get like glamour shots? No, I was. <laughs> That's what I think Brenda Condon's was. You oh, remember yes. hers with like the big hair the and all that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was thinking more along the lines of like an employee photo. You know, they oh, used to do be. like bring in that same company that would do mm. like school photos. I know yeah. it's different now, like <laughs> obviously in the 2000s. And Stand against that wall. I'm going to take a picture of you now. Yeah. They're like, oh, I'll take it with my iPhone and send it to my email and yeah. send it to the IT guy <laughs> to print you a card or whatever. But I think back then they probably, you know, did photos like that more yeah, often. So it could have been that too. But mm-hmm. either way, like you can see that she wore glasses and clearly, you know, if she's. Big smile on her face. Yeah. So about five hours after the official missing persons report was filed, sometime between 1.30 and 1.45 p.m. on Wednesday, January 5th, 1983, an officer with the Parsippany Troy Hills Police Department was patrolling the area around the Arlington Plaza Shopping Center in Parsippany, New Jersey, which was only about an eight to ten minute drive from Judy's home. During this routine patrol, the officer noticed a red car in the back of a parking lot of an establishment in the mall plaza known as Beefsteak Charlie's Restaurant. Upon further inspection, it was confirmed the vehicle the officer had spotted was Judy Brown's 1973 Red Ford Maverick. Now, John, I had sent you another photo as well, which you can see it's kind of a low quality image. It was from newspapers.com, but you can see that there is a parking lot there with a car situated in it and then underneath it it says where the car was found and it was over they said in like the right foreground of the photo near the dumpster so i know it's not like the clearest of photos to give you an idea but you can kind of tell that it was like set back in the lot it was kind of near the dumpster all that yeah i mean i don't know if these people that are in the photo are investigators but i mean it doesn't look super far out of the way to me no, it definitely it's doesn't. It's just like along the back of a building. Yeah, and it being behind a restaurant, you know, that's probably where everyone like leaves from the kitchen or something to throw things out in the dumpster, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, and also looking at this photo and mm-hmm. how I had asked you before, was there inclement weather or anything? Mm-hmm. It looks as though, and this is a black and white photo, so I could be totally wrong, but it looks like the ground is wet. Mm-hmm. It looks like in the foreground where you have the pine trees, it looks like there may be snow covering it. So... If we can assume that it's the dead of winter and it either rained or it snowed previously and it's now melting, you don't have the best driving conditions, Mm -hmm. assuming that the weather was like that or the ground was like that the night before. Yes. And I don't know if this photo was taken 
on that same day, if it was taken several days later, just to mm-hmm. show the area. So I'm not exactly sure, but if you want, I can so is look that her, up. That's not her vehicle in the picture. That then? is not her vehicle in the picture. No. Okay. So it says on here, the car was found near the dumpster pictured in the right foreground of the photograph. Okay. So you can see the dumpster over on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. So that's where her car was parked. But I this, I think, was like a day or two later or something, and a journalist came to the area just to snap a okay. photo of the general part of the parking lot where her car was found. All right, my mistake. I thought that that was like where her vehicle was found and they photographed the scene. No. Because the title of this photo is Death Scene. Yeah, I saw that. So I didn't know if it was photographed as it was Mm -hmm. when they found her. But again, just uh, another thing to keep in the back of your mind. Yep. Just in case it was bad weather, you know, would she have really left her house on her own? And if she did, why? Mm -hmm. Nope. All valid questions to ask. So when this officer approached the window of the vehicle, he saw what looked like a body seated in the front seat of the car, covered almost entirely with a blanket. Based on a piece written by Peter McKillop in the news, the Morris County prosecutor at the time, Lee Trumbull, described publicly exactly what that officer saw when he peered through that window. The article states, quote, The body was found covered with a blanket, except for one ankle. The victim's feet were pointed towards the driver's seat, The upper part of her body was on the passenger seat, with the rest of the body falling off the passenger seat, end quote. For me and everybody listening, can you repeat that one more time? Yes. Quote, the body was found covered with a blanket except for one ankle. The victim's feet were pointed towards the driver's seat. The upper part of her body was on the passenger seat, with the rest of the body falling off the passenger seat, end quote. Okay, so almost seated on the floor of the passenger side with her torso on the actual seat portion. That's kind of what it seems like to me. But the whole thing about that is that there were reports that said she was seated in the driver's seat. So there were definitely contradictory reports. That's like a huge difference, though. It absolutely is. So I would think that what the prosecutor is putting out publicly would be more accurate. Yes. And maybe the other information was like rumors or, you know, misconstrued comments from authorities or things like that. So this was the official statement from the prosecutor. Correct. Yes. He had, I don't know if he said this at like a press conference and the journalist, but it came from him, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it makes you wonder, was somebody else driving the vehicle at the time? Yes. That was definitely a question that I had. And then there's more that goes into it that I think will make you question everything even more. So let's keep going. But before we move on to the next part of the case, I did just want to mention that, you know, I had just said before the discrepancies with what seat she was found in, those kinds of things. And I had already, you know, mentioned multiple other discrepancies in reporting earlier. That's going to be a common theme in this case, unfortunately. So we're going to have to use our brains and deduce based on, you know, where these statements are coming from, other facts to kind of come to our own conclusions. But I just want everybody to know that there was definitely some contradictory reporting on this case. So, all right. Based on the scene, it was clear that the woman found in the car had been murdered, and it was later confirmed that she had been shot to death by what investigators believed was a small caliber gun. After the officer inspected the vehicle and confirmed the woman inside was most likely Judy Brown, authorities reached out to Peter to advise him that his wife was found murdered. Authorities then removed Judy's body from the vehicle that afternoon, and by that same evening, Peter Brown was at the Morristown Memorial Hospital morgue confirming that the woman located in the mall parking lot was, in fact, his wife. From there, it's a little unclear exactly who the lead agency was that took over the investigation into Judy Brown's murder, but it appears as though the Rockaway Township PD, Parsippany Troy Hills PD, and the Morris County Sheriff's Office all had involvement in the investigation as time went on, and that also included the Morris County Prosecutor's Office. I do believe it was Morris County that took over as the lead, though, due to where the crime took place. And as of today, Judy's case is listed as unsolved on the Morris County Prosecutor Office's website. So it's just yet another reason that makes me think like Morris County is who was in charge here. When you have an investigation where 
you know, so many different agencies can be involved. It seems like it's always a best practice to get the state police involved. Agreed. Because they have so many resources and they have jurisdiction across the entire state. And then Mm -hmm. if something crosses state lines, they can contact the other state PDs Mm -hmm. and just get everything going there. So I'm surprised to hear the state police weren't involved in this investigation. Yeah, no, I did not really see any mention of them whatsoever in my research on this case. It was majority Morris County, Mm -hmm. which obviously Rockaway Township, you know, these other locations, Parsippany, all that. It's all within Morris County. So I don't know if it's like because they were the overarching agency in this larger area rather than bringing in state police. They just used the larger agency compared to town police yeah that's the best i can think of who knows i mean we live in such a small state (laughs) i know it's like you would always call state police in (laughs) rhode island but right so like maybe in these larger states Mm. and i'll have to do some research on this to see if i can find out yeah perhaps there are so many counties in a larger state that a county so Mm. morris county maybe they act as like just before the step to state police and they cover you know so many cities in the state mm-hmm. and then there's another county that covers so many cities in the state yeah and then if you really need to step it up to the next level then you get the state police involved but maybe that kind of like a last resort before you start going up that chain yeah we should ask dawn i wonder if she knows because she lives in new jersey mm, we should yeah method of madness yes check it out <laughs> All right, so as authorities were reviewing the interior of the 73 Ford Maverick, as well as the parking lot of the Beefsteak Charlie's restaurant, a few things were discovered. First of all, the car was said to have been parked normally in the lot, so it appeared as though nothing about the car and where it was located would have really stood out to anyone. It wasn't parked across multiple parking spaces or haphazardly parked up on a curb or anything like that. And as we talked about a little bit ago, it was parked kind of in the back of the lot. And it was a location that a lot of people didn't park in frequently. You would assume probably employees, but not so much patrons of the restaurant. And on top of it, like investigators have said, she was covered with a blanket. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not like totally apparent that there is a murdered individual in this car Mm -hmm. at the time, even if you parked you know, somewhat near it and walked past. Based on what you know so far. (laughs) But I will say... The car seemed pretty inconspicuous if you were kind of just like walking through the lot and you weren't right up next to it, you know? Okay. Now, as I mentioned briefly just a minute ago, authorities had found that Judy had been shot, presumably by a small caliber gun, but there wouldn't be further details on the extent of her injuries, how many times she'd been shot, or where she was shot until her autopsy was completed. And that was scheduled for around 8 p.m. on January 5th, the same day her body was found. Now, I want to start regarding what was not found in Judy's car, and her car keys were at the top of that list. Authorities first determined that the car was actually locked upon their arrival, and once they were able to gain access to the vehicle, they discovered her keys were nowhere to be found. That could lead you to believe that whoever killed Judy had locked the car afterwards and taken the keys with them. Something else investigators were not able to locate during their search of the car was the murder weapon, which obviously led police to believe and to state publicly that there was no way that this was a suicide. Obviously, that's something that they would have put out because anybody could have guessed, you know, maybe this was a suicide. Did you find a gun in the car? Something like that. But I don't think it was like a thing that they believed, but I think it was something to just put out to the public to be like, no, there is definitely someone out there that has murdered this woman and you all need to be on the lookout for him. Okay, that's fair because through basic reasoning... Mm. Is somebody going to kill themselves and then cover themselves with a blanket? Uh, Exactly. But it was also stated that there was no sign of a struggle within the car either. So now moving on to what was found in the car. So we'll start with what we already know, which is that Judy was covered by the blanket. So the blanket is something that was found. And since I'm sure you probably will ask, John, yes, she was found fully clothed underneath it. And she still had her coat on because we know, obviously, it was January, pretty dang cold out. So this makes me think that there was a reason that this person killed her. Maybe something that she knew. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to think of a motive. Like, why would she have left the house? Mm -hmm. Why was she in the passenger seat of the vehicle? Why was somebody else maybe driving and somebody locked the door? Mm -hmm. What could she have told somebody to make them want to kill her? Something I wanted to bring up, too. And I had seen on, like, the one Reddit thread that's out there on this case 
I, th- I can't remember if it was the original poster or if it was somebody that commented on it, but they had mentioned that they talked to a family member who was in like psychology and all of this. And they said the fact that Judy was covered with a blanket could indicate some semblance of remorse on the part of the killer. Yeah, I could see it being remorse, but I could also see it buying them time. Yeah, just to cover her so that people walking by wouldn't see right, you, as much if she wasn't covered. Right, you have, you know, she's covered with a blanket, the vehicle is locked, so maybe, you know, a vagrant doesn't stumble by and, you know, try to go into a car and get change or whatever. Yeah. Or back in the day, steal a car because you could hotwire cars mm-hmm. much easier back then, but... Very true. Who knows, it could have been remorse, but it just as easily, I think, could have been... To buy them time. Yeah, I agree completely. And I did also want to say that it was later mentioned that this blanket did actually belong to Judy and it came from within her vehicle. And in terms of where she kept the blanket in her car, there were some reports that said the blanket was kept in her trunk while others said it was normally kept in the back seat. But regardless of where the blanket was usually stored, it overall belonged to Judy. It came in from car. her car. It wasn't something the killer brought with them. It was something they used that they found in her vehicle most likely after they had committed this crime. When I think about like a blanket in an old car, I think of like my grandparents Mm -hmm. and they used to have like an Afghan across the back seats. Yes, the Afghan. (laughs) John and I had a whole thing about this and I was like, I have never in my life called a blanket an Afghan. It's a blanket. Yeah, well, you know. French Canadian shit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I was just saying the other day, I'm like, wow, I really need to put a blanket in my car. Because of all the stuff happening in Buffalo. Yeah, all these people who are dying in their cars. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I need to make sure that I've got stuff to keep me warm. I need a go bag. I need, I'm like criminal <laughs> minds right here. I need my go bag. Wheels up at 20. You wouldn't, ha- <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have an Afghan though. You would have a space blanket. A space blanket. Yeah. You know the, oh the, yeah. The like one that they used in, 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 oh my God, what's, why can't I think of it? Station 11. Yes. Yes. What mm-hmm. he used out when he got attacked by the wolf. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I need one of those. Yeah. I was thinking. More along the lines of my comfy in space print. No, no, no. You don't want that. You want I want, a space blanket. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So where we're at right now, we know that by 8 p.m., the day that she was found murdered, mm-hmm. we have the autopsy happening. Correct. We know that the keys are missing. The blanket that she was covered with comes from the vehicle. She was fully clothed at the time of her murder. Correct. There we is more ha- about the car, though. So We don't have the murder weapon. We do not. Do we have any spent shell casings? Don't know. Okay. Let's continue on then. Yes, let's. So authorities also located Judy's handbag in her car. And at first, there were so many differing reports regarding whether her valuable personal belongings like cash, credit cards, things like that were still in her purse. Some publications stated that nothing valuable was missing, with others stating that nothing valuable was found in her purse, which initially indicated to me that those items may have been taken. But then there were also comments saying that only her car keys were missing, that her wallet and her purse were still with her. So yet again, here's another thing that it's like, who the frick knows what the truth is? Well, again, I would say if there is an official statement, I would usually err on the side of caution and say that they're right. Mm. But like generally, I mean, even if police tow a vehicle, Mm -hmm. it's common practice to conduct an inventory search of that. That way you can document if there are any items of value left inside. Mm -hmm. That way if it gets towed to the tow yard and then all of a sudden, you know, my speaker system's missing or my tools that were in the back seat are missing, at least it's documented that they were there at the time of the tow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you're talking a murder investigation, they must have documented everything that was in the vehicle and maybe somebody, you know, got things crossed yeah. When they were receiving information from the PD, yeah. if that's where they get their information. But, I mean, that's something big to flub up. You know? I agree, yeah. But if I had to guess, I don't think that valuables would have been taken in this case. So far, based on what you know. Mm-hmm. I can understand why you would believe that. But I do want to just keep it in the back of our minds as a potential for motive. Because as time went on, I guess it was sort of clarified that nothing was stolen from her, but it was never, at least in the early days of reporting, flat out said, no, this was not a robbery. That was not said early on at all. So I think it's just one of those things like keep it in the back of your mind as we learn more and more about this case as we keep going. 
literally just keep it there and you might learn things that might make you lean that way. You might learn things that might make you lean the other way. So I guess one question I have before we continue Mm -hmm. is, and you very well may not know this because it might not be public information, but did Peter ever say, like, did they ever frequent this area where she was found? And is this somewhere where she would have parked to go into a business or something? Unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. And Peter didn't talk much at all Mm -hmm. to the press in the beginning. And it was just, you know, one of those things where, like, you would get little tidbits from him here and there, but there wasn't a lot from Peter He wasn't at the forefront saying, this is everything I know. We need to find my wife's killer type thing. No. And, you know, I think... probably staying quiet, working with the police. But there are a lot of other things in terms of the media that we're going to talk about as we continue on with this case that I think could have overshadowed all of that in general. So okay. as we keep going, I, you might start thinking, you know, even our listeners too, like, hmm, that's weird. Why wasn't he out there like mm-hmm. trying to, you know get his wife's killer caught but there's a lot more to uncover as we keep going so your opinions on that can definitely change all right now something else authorities ascertained from their search of the interior of judy's car was that it was covered in blood which led them to believe that she had been killed in her car not somewhere else and then placed there so this was something that i wanted to talk to you about john in terms of blood spatter and if obviously I don't know if you you know would know all of these things but it was just like stuff that was kind of going through my mind as I was researching this case if someone were in the car with her when they shot her Mm -hmm. wouldn't blood spatter have gotten on them and then essentially like blocked it from getting into other places in the car and then authorities would be able to determine from there oh This person was in the car versus outside of the car with the window open when this happened. So would they expect to find physical evidence then if the person was in the car versus being outside of the car? It's hard to say like yes or no. Yes, it's possible. And I would err on the side of saying yes. Like if the person was seated in the vehicle with her Mm -hmm. and shot her, there was a good chance that the blood spatter not only goes through the exit wound, Mm -hmm. if there was one, but also front-facing. Yeah. For instance, I know it's fictional, but bear with me. In Pulp Fiction, when you have Jules and Vincent driving in the car, Vincent, like an idiot, is facing the back seat where Marvin is sitting, Mm -hmm. got his finger on the trigger, they hit a bump, and he accidentally shoots him in the head. Mm -hmm. Blood spatter goes everywhere in the car. Yeah. So... Yes, I think anything is possible, but there are a lot of factors and variables that go into that. All right, so before we continue on, I did just want to bring up one other thing regarding our discussion of the scene. Originally, I'd say within the first day or so after Judy was found murdered, it appeared as though authorities considered the fact that maybe the Browns' home itself could have been where everything started that night. For example... Say someone came to her house, somehow was able to get her to leave, and forced her to drive to the specific location where she was killed. So I guess if this were the case, you could consider their home as a part of the scene as well. Mm -hmm. But like I mentioned earlier on, the Browns' home showed no signs of a struggle, and it didn't appear as though anyone had broken in or potentially forced Judy to leave her home against her will. And after further investigation, it seemed as though authorities were sure that the lack of a struggle or anything like that in the house indicated that Judy herself chose to leave and head to the mall that night if that were, in fact, her original destination. And I had mentioned before that Judy was found wearing her coat. So you'd think if someone had come and attacked Mm -hmm. her in her house and forced her out, they're not going to be like, oh, hold on a second, grab your coat and then we can leave. You know, my whole thing is why would they go to the house? force her to get into the vehicle, tell her to drive somewhere, tell her to get into the passenger side of the vehicle, Mm. if that's accurate, which I think we can safely assume that it probably is, Mm -hmm. and then execute her in the passenger side of the vehicle. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. sense. No. No. It makes more sense that she would go somewhere, meet up with someone, they would then want to drive the vehicle, Mm -hmm. she gets into the passenger seat, and then whatever transpires happens. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem like the house is part of the crime scene. 
yes, but I think it was a good thought on yeah, totally investigators' behalf to say, we can't say for sure that it didn't all start here. We can't say for sure that maybe she didn't get a phone call that mm-hmm. lured her out of the house, you know, something like that. What was the episode that we talked about with a, there was a, a guy that owned a body shop down the street and somebody heard a scream in the middle of the night. We thought that the girl could have came to the door. Lila, Lila Poitras. Lila Poitras. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, could she have been lured out by somebody saying that they needed help? possible it is definitely possible but mm-hmm. in terms of like if there were any phone calls or anything right. like neighbors forcibly, heard right was she forcibly removed from the house and forced to go somewhere no mm-hmm. could there be no signs of a struggle and she was tricked into leaving the house still possible. a possibility yeah agreed all right so moving on in terms of if any physical evidence was found at the scene i can't quite say what authorities discovered and collected exactly, but I do know they had brought in canines to search the car and the parking lot, and it was reported that whatever evidence had been located at the scene was sent to the state police lab for examination, which just seems like a common comment that all of the authorities make in these cases. Oh, whatever we found was sent for examination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So helpful. Right. What about uh, seat position for the driver's seat? None of that was released. Because seat position is important. If you think back to Jennifer Kessie's case, Mm -hmm. it is clear that somebody else was driving that vehicle. Yep. And she was not. Yes. Agreed. So, you know, we know that there are always little things that police keep to themselves. And I don't know. I feel like seat position wouldn't be that big of a deal to release. But who am I to say, you know, I'm a little old podcaster Brit over here. But (laughs) still. But I mean, understandably, I mean, they don't have to release like that is the piece of information Mm -hmm. that brought them to the realization that somebody else was driving the vehicle. Yeah. But they could say, based on evidence we've uncovered, it is believed that somebody else was operating the vehicle prior to her murder. Definitely. Also, I do just want to say that if anything was found or what they said that was found, you know, that was sent to the state police lab and all that, I don't know what that was. And we never find out what it was or if it meant anything, because I haven't heard anything about DNA or fingerprints Mm -hmm. or hair evidence or anything like that in Mm. this case, unfortunately. Interesting. You know what's strange? What's strange, And I may just be thinking this for no reason whatsoever, but do a lot of the cases that we cover occur in the colder months when people could be wearing gloves? I wonder. I'm going to have to look at our case log. I'm going to have to look at it too, because I feel like I don't cover a lot of summer (laughs) cases. That's weird. I feel like there's a lot of fall and winter. Mm. Sorry, guys. If you want more summer cases, let me know. Yeah, give us some advice on uh, what we should cover. Yes, definitely. I want recommendations from you guys. Give me recommendations. Give Brittany recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, the night of January 5th, Judy's autopsy was performed by Morris County Medical Examiner Ernest Tucker. As we already know, Judy had been shot. But after the completion of the autopsy, it was confirmed that her cause of death was from two gunshot wounds, one to her lower right stomach area and the other to her lower right chest area. I do just want to make mention, though, that I did see a couple of reports that stated Judy had been shot on the left side of her chest and abdomen. But during my research, it seemed like it was reported more that she was shot on the right side of her body. So that's kind of what I'm going with. But again, lots of discrepancies. Okay, so two gunshot wounds. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it was like that the car was covered in blood and it was a small caliber round. Well, let's keep going. Early on, prior to the completion of the autopsy, authorities appeared to be under the impression that the murder weapon was likely that small caliber gun. However, after a couple of days and further clarity, it was released that Judy had actually been shot with a shotgun not a handgun like previously believed. That makes a little more sense now. Yes, but it was stated that even though the weapon believed to be used was a shotgun, it was still a small gauge. And according to Mike Stoddard's reporting for the Herald News, quote, the prosecutor said the two gunshot wounds were at first thought to be from a small caliber weapon, but were actually entrance wounds from shotgun shells, end quote. Now he's saying shotgun shells... That would make me think slugs, Mm -hmm. which would not necessarily be a small caliber. Well, unless we're talking. I'm just going to keep saying well and then give you more (laughs) information because I have more. So let me just give you this last little bit and then we can discuss. Okay, because the wheels are turning and I'm just yeah, I'm just kicking up dust right now. 
Yes. And I'll give you more on this in just a second. So early on, authorities stated that they were going to be keeping the information regarding the gauge of the shotgun to themselves. But I did see a handful of articles that stated the murder weapon was likely a 410 gauge shotgun. With that being said, due to the fact that authorities didn't want to release that information, I don't exactly know how accurate that is. But you'd have to think whoever the source was for these articles, they were probably in the know. They probably knew, you know, a fair amount of information. And I really don't think that a good journalist wouldn't have reported this if there wasn't some truth to it. But again, who knows? People do messed up shit. But your ego will drive you to do stupid things sometimes. Yeah, but I did see it a fair few times. And then it was also reported again, like a year ish later in regards to another case that we're going to discuss in a minute. Well, not really in a minute, in in a lot of minutes, but, (laughs) you know, it was just it was something that was mentioned enough times that it stood out to me as it was probably this gauge, especially when you look at the size of a 410 slug. So So, hold on. There's a little bit more. Okay. That you need to have before we discuss. Only thing I was going to say in preface to, again, people that don't know firearms or anything, 410 to me does not ring a bell. Like I have to go to the recesses of my memory. Yeah. To even imagine what this 410 caliber is yep so well that is why we're going to have photos on our socials and our website that you can see a really good comparison between like your general like 12 gauge or 20 gauge that you might be thinking of versus this 410 okay also another finding in the autopsy was that judy had been shot at point blank range and she had burn marks on her body presumably from either the muzzle of the gun or gunpowder burns This indicated to the Emmy and authorities that the gun was either touching her body or not far from it when she was shot. So that leads me to believe that whoever killed her was in the car with her when they shot her to be able to get that close. Now, assuming that a shotgun was used, because sometimes there are other types of firearms that are crafted or put together or whatever Mm -hmm. that can use ammunition that you wouldn't necessarily think that they could. Mm -hmm. But when I think of you know, burns from like a firearm muzzle or from gunpowder. I always think like somebody that's going to rob you comes and puts a gun right up to you and says, give me this. Mm -hmm. That's what I think too. Yeah. But if this person, if this person did in fact use a long barrel shotgun and they had it like under a trench coat or something. Yeah. I mean, you're inside a vehicle. You don't have much room to move. Okay. So I want to preface this next part by saying We recently got a not very nice comment from someone on one of our YouTube videos in regards to, quote unquote, poor research on our part (laughs) and not speaking to community members. And, you know, normally I'm not one to call people out for rude comments. People say mean things on the Internet all the time. But I was kind of annoyed. Well, research is a touchy subject for you because you go like layer upon layer upon layer to try and get the best and most accurate facts to put this story together once a week as well (laughs) right so that's the thing like i am not and i'll i'm not saying that i am i'm not an investigative journalist you know i'm finding the things that i have available to me on the internet and yes i'll talk to people who might be in the know about certain things if i want a little bit more information but i'm finding the majority of my information on the internet So if you don't like what the Internet's saying, take it up with the Internet, because (laughs) I'm just taking from reputable sources that I can find. Right. I mean, you're not browsing Reddit and 4chan and I mean, I do. I browse them, but I don't use them as fact. Right. Right. Wikipedia is not your primary source. I mean, anybody can go on the website and they can look at the numerous sources. We pay a lot of dollars a year for newspapers.com. Okay, guys? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, we're talking newspaper articles. We're talking multiple, multiple different sources. Mm -hmm. Police Departments online write-ups on these cases, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that. And I'm doing my absolute best to get the most accurate information out there because I don't want to not do somebody's story justice. Right, just because you don't know about it yourself. Exactly. So I do the best that I can to research something, and I will always preface it by saying that I am not an expert. So I'm going to preface this by saying I am not an expert in firearms, but a family member of John's is... And I sat down with him for a little while. Shout out to you, Chris, if you're listening. But we sat down for a little while, I would say like maybe half hour, 45 minutes, so that we could have a conversation about the gun and the potential of what kind of weapon was used. Because my very first question when I asked him about this was, 
How on earth is someone getting a big, long-barreled shotgun in a car, especially this sporty Ford Maverick, and having the ability to shoot someone awkwardly in this seat? And it was just, how could that be possible? I was very confused by it. Right. And the, the only thing, and not to cut you off, but mm-hmm. the only thing that comes to mind for me, and I always reference movies, I'm a movie buff, whatever, mm-hmm. it's the second one this episode now, but I think of um, the original Terminator, yeah. where... You know, Reese gets a shotgun, takes a saw, and saws off the shotgun. So So, that was another thought that I had as well. Could it have been a sawed-off shotgun? Possibly. Right. Which is very, very, very illegal. Do not do it. But it was (laughs) hidden under his trench coat. That's a movie I have not seen. All right. So what did you learn with Chris? So Chris made a comment to me that I would have never in a million years thought. So first and foremost, John, I want you to Google what a 410 gauge shotgun shell looks like versus other gauges. Stand by. Googling. I have a picture here on the Big Game Hunting blog. Did (laughs) you see that one? Yeah. I'm currently on ammo.com slash comparison slash 410 versus 12 gauge. All right. Well, here, let me send this to you. Oh, this is much better than what I was looking at. Okay. Yeah. If you go like halfway down the page, it'll show you what the gauge is above each of those. So the one all the way to the right is a 410. Yeah, so the 410, it's long and slender. Correct. Mm -hmm. So comparing that to the 20 gauge, Mm -hmm. significant difference in circumference. Yes, probably half. The 410 is roughly half. It's very thin. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised to see how thin that was. It looks more like a 45 caliber that you'd find in a pistol, almost. Well, apparently you can use this type of ammunition in a revolver. Interesting. Which, Chris told me that the round or the shell or whatever doesn't shoot out of a revolver like it would in a handgun, a pistol, a a shotgun. Right. You go through your entire cylinder, Mm -hmm. then you have to crank it open, dump them out. out. Exactly. So if they don't have shell casings, which I don't know if they do, could that be a possibility? So then my mind was going and I'm like, okay, so if you have this smaller caliber weapon they were already confused thinking that it was you know this small caliber handgun now you're saying it's a shotgun are they saying that because why like i don't know what they have that makes them believe it's for sure a shotgun and not having come out of a revolver because it's possible and i did not know that that was ever possible i mean it makes way more sense that you have a small revolver hidden in your pocket hidden in your pocket And you're fitting this random ammunition into Mm -hmm. it. Who the hell is walking around a mall parking lot with a shotgun hidden under a trench coat? Probably not a lot of people. Right. I mean, or who that's, you know. Hanging out with Judy. Right. You're trying to obfuscate the fact that they have a weapon on them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would choose to carry a shotgun. That was my exact thought on it. Now, I just have another website that I was kind of browsing through and... Mm -hmm. It's a gun digest, and you have uh, 410 revolvers intended purpose. Part of this article states, quote, As evidenced both by marketing surrounding 410 revolvers, as well as the rhetoric of their advocates, these guns were bought and sold with self-defense in mind. Mm. Advertised as a versatile, compact, yet devastating weapon, the 410 revolver quickly gained a following of dedicated carriers. The concept was popular enough to spur the creation of defensive 410 loads, purpose-built for use in handguns. The Taurus Judge was not actually the first 410 revolver, but it was the first widely popular model that drove companies like Smith & Wesson to iterate the concept. End quote. Now, I don't know if you found this image, but I'm going to send it to you to add it to social media mm-hmm. because it's some, essentially an ad for this Taurus handgun. Mm-hmm. And at the top, it shows, you know, an undamaged watermelon. And then it has three other images of stages while it's being shot. It's very interesting that you say that because Chris was showing me all these videos, too, when we were sitting Mm -hmm. down together of what it would look like using the 410 in a revolver shooting through the jelly. Mm, Yes. Ballistic Essentially, yeah emulates what it would do when shot into someone's body and a lot of those and obviously I don't know this I don't have the autopsy report for Judy I don't have any of this information but I wonder 
if authorities had gone and looked at a revolver instead of a shotgun mm -hmm. to see if shooting that it would look similar to the way the bullets went through judy versus the way it might go through this ballistic gel yeah and i mean when you said that the car was covered in blood mm -hmm. and then i see this ad for the taurus handgun mm -hmm. and you see the watermelon and the quote is can your handgun do this no probably not oh boy okay send it to me let's see i sent it to you on discord oh, okay like it totally destroys this watermelon so it would make sense yeah. that a small handgun like this carrying that 410 round mm -hmm. would create such devastation and probably you know an entry and exit wound mm -hmm. on judy's body mm -hmm. spraying matter and mm -hmm. blood everywhere in the car yeah so i would think that like authorities probably knew this or looked into this or something like that but if I didn't know this, if you didn't know this, if other people in the police world, the detective world don't know this, if they're not firearms experts, if they don't have all this stuff under their belt, they might not even recognize that this ammunition could have been used in another gun. Because I would think a shotgun shell could never be used in another weapon. I would always right. think immediately my mind would go, she was said to have been shot by a shotgun. There's no other way this could have ever been another weapon. So when Chris brought that up to me and he's showing me this other gun and he's showing me how small this ammunition is and he's explaining all the possibilities of how and why it could totally work that it was this way, my initial question of how and why would someone be trying to conceal a shotgun, that question kind of went out the window because I was like, okay, I mean, maybe that's not even a part of this case. Maybe it was a revolver. And I don't think that it's out of the realm of possibility that it was this type of gun and not actually a shotgun. Right. I think that it very well could have been. Now, just as a notice to people listening, mm -hmm. that ad that I sent to Brittany that we'll put on our social media, mm -hmm. that's for the Taurus Judge, which wasn't produced until 2006. Yeah, we had talked about that. Now, doing a little more digging, even though the Taurus and the Thunder 5 and who knows however many other revolvers that can chamber a 410 round have been created more recently mm -hmm. if you look back to even 1967 there is the thompson slash center contender which was also you know linked to a colt 45 mm -hmm. those can all chamber a 410 round so there were revolvers available at the time of judy's murder that could chamber a 410 round yeah so that was the whole thing. And I remember initially when Chris and I were talking about it, he's like, oh, hold on. That was manufactured this year. That was manufactured this year. It's like you have to make sure that it existed in 83 because it's all right. well and good now in 2022. But if it didn't exist back then, it couldn't have been used. Right. So it does appear as though there are some revolvers that could chamber this round that were available during the time period when she was murdered. Yeah, definitely. And I highly recommend everyone to go take a look at that. You know, we're obviously going to have photos and stuff on our socials. I'll link to some of the YouTube videos too, just so you can see. And I would be really interested to know if the way the rounds go into that ballistic gel emulated what the Emmy was able to uncover in her autopsy. Yeah, it would be great to be able to compare that. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure we have some people that have vast knowledge of firearms and mm. ballistics and stuff that listen. So if we're off in anything that we say or... If we're accurate or if you have anything to expand upon, mm -hmm. just let us know. Definitely. And just know I did do my research. I would never say that your research is poor. Sometimes my research is too much. Mm -hmm. Like I that agree. one person who was like, they give endless details that go nowhere. <laughs> well, they're details of the case, sir. Yes. If you don't like them, don't listen. And I mean, we're both perfectionists to an extent. Yes. Where we wouldn't want to put out content that wasn't vetted. And, and and if we were to find out something quality. later, you guys can bet that we will absolutely own up to mistakes and we will say so. Right. But anyway, we're going to move right along now. We had enough conversation about the firearms. So we're still keeping on with the autopsy here. So in terms of any sort of indication of sexual assault, there was none. And as we know, Judy was fully clothed. She still had her coat on, all that. And in regards to the time of death, that piece to the autopsy findings is probably the most confusing. So it was originally reported that Judy had been deceased for at least 24 hours by the time her body was found. But if you're doing quick math in your head right now, that timeline makes no sense. 
So we know exactly. (laughs) We know Judy was seen leaving work at 5 p.m. And then she spoke to her husband around 6, 630 at the latest. We also know she was found deceased in the mall parking lot around 130 the following day. So mathematically, the longest she could have been deceased would have been anywhere from 18 to 20 hours. So you're at least at a minimum four to six hours off on time of death right there. I mean, could she have left her house right after getting off the phone? Technically, yes. So, sure, if they're building a timeline and they know that when they're doing the autopsy and the last time that anybody saw her or talked to her Mm -hmm. was 630, Mm -hmm. sure, you can say within 24 hours. But, I mean, you would hope that it would be narrowed down more than 24 hours. Agreed, yeah. And sometime later, it was actually narrowed down a little bit more and it was further clarified that her time of death could have been around midnight. But I personally have a problem with that time frame as well, because we know Judy had to have left her house after 6 p.m. when she talked to her husband, and obviously before 7.45 when he arrived home to find her gone. I personally feel as though she was likely attacked shortly after arriving to the mall, obviously like we talked about if that were her original destination, or if she was there, if she went shopping and she walked back to her car, that could have been. But I would bet my paycheck on the fact that she was not at the mall until midnight. And if this time of death is more accurate, then I would think that that means her killer would have held her for a number of hours before killing her. I mean, held her or she was with them. I mean, I guess if it was someone that she knew and she was hanging out with. Yeah, that's possible. But just like considering the scene, the lack of sexual assault, where her car was found, if this person didn't know her, then there's no way this time frame makes sense for me either. So... It's leading me down the path of either midnight is not right or it was someone that knew her that she was willing to spend all this time with. Yeah, I think that's fair to speculate on. Yeah, but of course, that is just my opinion on things. But I will say there is a comment in later reporting where Prosecutor Trumbull mentions that Judy's time of death estimates may not be completely accurate. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty clear based on the statements that were put out, but at least he clarified it, right? Yes, I suppose. Yeah. So, I mean, that's official just... Official statement, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I mean, it's just covering your butt. Of course it is, yeah. I would want to know more about the area where the vehicle was found. Mm-hmm. If anybody ever came forward and said, oh, I saw that car at midnight last night, or mm-hmm. I left work at 11 o'clock and that vehicle was already there, but I just didn't think anything of it. Mm-hmm. You know, how heavily trafficked this area was. Did a lot of people go to the shopping center? Did anybody ever park in that area outside of employees? There are Mm -hmm. so many factors that you would want to know to try and place that vehicle there at an approximate time Mm -hmm. more exactly than, oh, within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. I mean, I think that she was probably shot and killed in that parking spot, Mm -hmm. not you know, shot in the car and then driven there and then left there. Agreed. Because you also got to think, like, if there is blood everywhere in that car, this mm-hmm. person shot her and killed her and then drove in blood, mm-hmm. however far of a distance. It's to already park it there. risky to even be leaving that location covered mm-hmm. in blood. Right. What if you got pulled over? Mm-hmm. So I think it was they went to that location and then whatever transpired there happened. And it seems to me more of a crime of passion because you're not thinking that through at that rate. To say, like, I'm going to shoot her in her car. I'm going to be covered in blood. I'm going to have to figure out a way to get home. I'm going to be in her car. Where's my car going to be? Mm-hmm. Like, there are just so many factors that could get you caught mm-hmm. that it doesn't seem like a pre-planned thing to me. Now, after the news of Judy's murder broke, the surrounding areas were in an absolute panic. Obviously, any community reeling from something like this would be. But it turns out that the death of Judy Brown wasn't the only tragedy plaguing Morris County during this time. Judy Brown was now the sixth local murder in just four short months. Tune in next week for part two of the murder of Judy Brown. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, 
Tune in next week for an all-new episode.